The British first started interfering in Sudanese affairs at the end of the 19th century. Convinced of their mission to civilize, they sent in their most powerful colonial leader, Charles Gordon, to abolish the shameful Arab slave trade and introduce a modern variant, colonial trade. Gordon never managed to eradicate the slave trade, but by spreading Christianity, he provoked a strong Islamic fundamentalist reaction. And revolutionaries led by Mahdi, the long-awaited prophet, promptly decapitated Gordon. England rose against the new religious fervor with modern military technology. In the Great Battle of Khartoum in 1898, the united British-Egyptian army massacred 12,000 of Mahdi's followers who were armed with nothing but swords and the belief that they were immune to infidel bullets. The victorious British then drew the same borders of Sudan that we find today. After the British departure in the mid-50s, what remained enclosed within those borders was a multitude of different peoples and cultures unable to find a common language. The descendants of black slaves in the south never trusted the descendants of the slave hunters in the north, and vice versa. In 1983, soon after the Americans discovered abundant quantities of crude oil on the border between the Arab North and the African South, war broke out. Some observers believe it was the CIA who incited the Southerners to fight for oil. Others claim that they rose up simply in protest against Islamic laws, which all of a sudden forbade the consumption of alcohol and demanded that adulterers be stoned. Whichever the case, there seems to be no end to the war. The conflict between the Sudanese and global vested interests has so far claimed at least two million victims. And the Nuba have suffered most in the fight to control Sudanese natural resources. The Nuba mountains lie in the north, on the Arab side, just above the line between the two Sudans as drawn by the British. Just like the oil in the swamps and the uranium in the Nuba mountains, the Nuba people themselves were caught between two fires. However, Mahdi's dervishes Mystics of the Islamic sect of Sufis survived everything. In Khartoum, they gather every Friday at the cemetery Al Sheikh Hamad Al Nil and spin around until they fall into a trance. Then they hug each other and celebrate. I also found myself caught up in the euphoric state. I felt the ecstatic trance, able to exorcise my fears and to move my deepest being from my brain into my heart. Women as well indulge in the collective expression of feelings. A few thousand gather in the courtyard of Sheikh Abdelaziz. While the Sheikh devotedly reads passages from the Quran, the women pray, cry, scream, and exorcise Satan, who is believed to be responsible for hysteria, depression, paralysis, and other afflictions. I was quite overwhelmed by the spiritual power which the Northern Sudanese used to control their everyday problems, and scared too, because I suspected that the same power was being abused by the pragmatists in the Arab government for quite non-religious purposes. The fanatical fundamentalists try to scare the foreigners who want to possess their natural riches with an ideology akin to ein Volk, ein Land, ein Führer. 
Extreme nationalism, fascism and communism strengthen the unity and power of a nation. All who are marginal, all who are different, like the Nuba, they need to be incorporated into a single people who believe in the same God in order to be strong and able to resist the superior Westerners, as happened once before in the time of the great Mahdi. And that is really what uh, uh, people look after reality and uh, happiness. Happiness is unity, you see. It's not to be so many things. And just, it's, it's insane. It is said to be so many things, you see. Lying and hoping for things that are real things, like money. Because if you have money, you are strong. If you are strong, you are going to dominate other people. It's like, these are just the false things. They are not true things. Where you are going, life is, is not like that. When you go to the Nuba mountains, as you say, you can live with nature, in harmony with nature. Even if they, their parents, if they believe in trees, it's more natural than what, than what we have here, because they believe in nature. I had no idea what was in store for me. In order to look like the local people, I had a white Arab jalaba made. I got my bike ready, loaded it up with water containers. A week later, and a thousand kilometers further south, the Arab world transforms rapidly into the African. With a great deal of luck, and without major problems, and with my trusty bike, I managed to sneak behind the war zone, where no foreigner has penetrated for 17 years. I was first arrested in the village of Abbasia, and I was only rescued thanks to an interview published in the Islamic National Party Gazette, in which I was presented as the friend of the revolution. For a few days, I was all alone. I enjoyed peace and solitude and almost forgot about the war. I felt at home as I hadn't felt for a long time. Perhaps Africa really is the original home of all people. Perhaps I was really traveling toward my roots. Home. Home. I'm going home. Hello! A long time ago, all this was the land of the Nuba. However, the first Nuba I came across had already been converted to Islam. They were Arabs. They offered me food and water. They imbued me with willpower and courage. And they gave me directions to Kauniaro. It was more than 50 degrees Celsius, absolutely dry and very, very thorny. I was fixing the punctures one after the other, all the time, up to 20 times a day. On the fourth day, I ran out of water. In that heat, you can die in a day without water. I was going crazy. My tires were flat. And then suddenly, they rode towards me from the bush and offered me a bowl of milk, camel milk. What an incredible animal, the camel. It walks through a furnace weighed down with burdens and transforms my enemy, the thorn, into a life-saving elixir. <laughs> Two 
After seven days of cycling, I finally found Miaro. In this Nuba village in 1949, the British photographer and filmmaker George Roger shot the scenes which made the Nuba famous all over the world. The pictures attracted the attention of the German artist Leni Riefenstahl, who, charmed by the beauty and power of the Nuba, published her book, The People of Kau, in 1976 which made the Nuba even more famous. This is what it was like a long time ago.